Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, Jesus began to speak to the chief priests and the scribes and the elders in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head, and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed, and so with many others. Some they beat, and some they killed. And so he had still one other, a beloved son. Finally he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, somehow most of us tend to have this unspoken expectation that if I am good, then people will treat me good. If I am good, then uh, life will conspire in order to make my wishes and dreams come true. But there was no better person on the face of the earth than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Our Master and Lord went about doing good with all his time and energy. And you would expect that a person like him would have been welcomed with open arms by everyone. But you see, in every time and place, there are people whose hearts and lives are invested in sin, in corruption and in vice. And it is because of their attachment to sin and corruption and vice that they resist good, they resist what is true, they resist what is beautiful. And so if the Lord and Master himself and all the prophets who came before him and the saints and martyrs like the saints of today, saints Charles Luanga and his companions, if they had to face the corruption, the evil that surrounded them, which led them ultimately to martyrdom, how much more you and I? As Christians, as disciples of Christ, we must expect some kind of resistance when we start on the road to sainthood. And all of us, thanks be to God, we are sinners, yes, with a past, but we are also saints with a future. And St. Peter, in the first reading of today, charts out for us eight steps to become a saint. Eight steps to become a saint. And uh, many of us rush either, either to the beginning or to the end of the list. But the, the points that come in between are also equally important. The first point is, we all start with faith. No one becomes a saint without faith, strong faith in what we come to believe in Christ and the teachings of the church that follow from that faith in Christ. Many people stagnate at that level where you're, you're so, so much in love with Jesus um, and you think that that is the end game of the spiritual life. Falling in love with Jesus is the first step. The next step that St. Peter puts uh, before us is growing in virtue. 
Uh, let me read that text for you as it is. For this very reason, he says, for those of us who are living in a corrupt world, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Now, let's go one by one very quickly. We do not stop with falling in love with Jesus and believing in Him. We must build that up with a life of virtue. Otherwise, our faith becomes very shallow. There are some Christians who think, just my faith in Jesus is going to get, give me a free ticket to heaven so I can do anything that I want. And uh, when at the end of my life, I can just say, Lord, I believe in you. Please forgive me. No. The Lord might turn to us and say, who are you? We have that famous passage in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says to the person who had done so many things in Jesus' name, Depart from me. I do not know you. It's because we did not build a life of virtue after we came to faith. The second thing is knowledge. Sometimes faith can be so, so fickle, it can be like you have a great high and you feel, oh, God is, has been so great to me. And then you, the next thing, something hits you and you feel like God has abandoned me. And that's why knowledge of the will of God, the plan of God, the larger perspective of life is important. A, a deeper catechesis after we have an initial experience is important. Self-control. Some of us struggle in the area of consistency in our walk of faith. We have certain habitual sins that we give in to out of a force of habit. And so, building a life of virtue proactively actually helps us to give up certain habitual sins that we are attached to. And sometimes it can become like a, a, a game of willpower. And then you, you, you find that even your will is weakened in the fight against sin. You give in in certain areas where you least expect yourself to give in. And that's where you need to build up steadfastness. A, a desire to be faithful to the Lord you have committed. And finally, godliness. Godliness, re realizing that throughout our spiritual journey, God is the one who is holding us. He is the one who is carrying us through. And He is the one who has chosen us. And if He has chosen us, He will keep us faithful. And then this can become uh, an exercise of self-perfection, which even the Greek philosophers used to do. Now, to make our virtue Christian, it must be tied down to the last two points brotherly affection and love. Charles Luanga might have become a great saint on his own if he had just stood fast and died on his own. But the beauty of his saint is that he exhorted his brothers. He, with brotherly affection, he didn't want to not just save himself for eternity. He also wanted to save his brothers. And so he exhorted all of them to resist the advances of the king. And all of them together, out of love for God and as a testament to those who were bought in by corruption and evil, gave up their lives rather than give in to sin. This is how the saints teach us to practice these eight steps. Let us pray that through the intercession of St. Charles Luanga and his companions, we may put these eight steps to sainthood into practice in our own lives, in our own circumstances. May the Lord whom we receive in spiritual communion today strengthen us in the battle against sin. Amen.